Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rick Olson. I'm talking about Git, the stupid NoSQL database. Um, I'm a programmer at GitHub. You know, I work with uh, Ruby a lot and uh, JavaScript, CoffeeScript, lots of cool stuff. So, so uh, what is Git? I assume everyone here knows what Git is. Um, so Git is basically a distributed version control system. Um, I'm not going to go into how Git, you know, how uh, most people use Git, you know, for versioning their uh, source code. You know, at GitHub, we use Git more as um, as a database. If you look at the man page for uh, for Git, the the, uh, the name, you know, they they call it the stupid content tracker. And uh, reading this, it can't, it struck me as odd, you know, because everyone uses Git the same way. They use Git as a source co uh, source control tool. But really, it's just this generic tool for storing data, you know, um, storing revision data that just happens to be good for storing a uh, source code. Um, so I, um, so at GitHub, I, I thought about this a little bit, and uh, you know, working there, I saw like how we used Git, and it seemed more like a NoSQL database. But I really hate that term, NoSQL. It's it's like you know, it turns into this like us versus them. Like, if you use a database, you're like stuck in the old world, you know. And then other people are using like Redis and and MongoDB and stuff like that. So I'm not trying to sell you on Git. It's not going to make your app sexier or anything like that. Um, I mean, it's just one option. Um, so at its core, Git is a key value store. Like every you know every file, every object in there, you access. Through a SHA, which is you know the key, and you get back some kind of value, which is you know the content of your your uh, source code. So this is what Git looks like when it's just writing data to the Git database. Um, the Git hash object command is is uh, probably not used very often, but all it does is take some data and writes it to the Git object database in Git's format, and it gives you back a SHA, and that that SHA is basically is just the uh, you know, SHA-1 hash of the content. And then it gets, you know, compressed and stored in, on the file system. And if you want to access this data, you can use, you can just, you can call a cat file, which will just read the data out and, uh, you know, read it from the uh, Git format on your, on your hard drive and just print it back out. Um, that's basically like the core of how uh, Git works internally. And when you do that, you get a blob. The blob is just any, you know, any content, you know, any type of content. Git doesn't really care what the format is, so it can be, you know, JSON, it could be an image, it could be whatever. Um, the interesting thing, though, is this blob knows nothing about itself. It's just content. It doesn't know what file name it is. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't even really. Well, it knows what size it is, and that's about it. But Git is also a graph database. Um, a graph database is where you, you store nodes in a system, and then you track relationships with other nodes. Um, so with Git, we have trees. You know, trees track relationships with, uh, with blobs. A tree is just basically a directory listing. So each, um, each file is, uh, each tree is just a listing of file names and then a pointer to the, uh, to the blob that it's talking about. And uh, so that's that's what that graph looks like. We have a tree here, and it's pointing to you know multiple blobs. And then at a higher level, we have commits. Commits are just uh, a record of of changes, and they track you know the uh, committer and when it was committed, and they track the uh, the author of the you know the original author and when the code uh, when the original commit was authored. And all a commit does is it points to it points to a tree. And then that tree points to like sublevel trees that point to other blobs and other trees. So you start getting this like this graph of data. Um, and then the next uh, next thing we have uh, references. They're basically just uh, post-it notes that point to a commit object. Um, and they're just literally files in the uh, Git database with a SHA. And then you look that up and you find your commit. And then from there you can look up the tree and then any blobs underneath. So you get this 
you, know, you get this whole structure where you know at the top you know you have various uh, references like branches that point to commits that point to trees and then blobs. And then uh, you also have tags. Uh, tags. Um, when I started at GitHub, I really didn't know a whole lot about how this stuff worked. Uh, tags was one thing I just I knew nothing about. I knew they were just references that pointed to arbitrary commits. You know, people use them a lot for. Uh, for releases, um, and one of the uh, first projects I worked on at GitHub was updating the downloads page. Uh, someone filed in a support issue that uh, you know they didn't like how the downloads page only showed the commit. You know, and they they mentioned that we could use uh, annotated tags to provide more information about uh, you know about the commit. This is a screenshot of one of my projects, and I clearly don't know how to use tags. You know the you know the the uh, description isn't very helpful. You know it's like either like a you know a version bump or it's like the last commit that I made, which is you know updating the README or something. It's not very helpful. Um, so looking at the support issue, I looked into annotated tags. Um, annotated tags are actual objects in the uh, Git database. Um, they can track who tagged it and when the thing was tagged, and you can also uh, sign the tag if you want to do all that. Um, the cool thing is you, you can do this to put more information about your release. Uh, this is the Rails project. Um, if you look at the bottom for uh, version 235, they've, you know, they have like a change log of you know, the big changes in this release. So, so doing this, we're able to pack more information into the, um, into the uh, downloads page. So if project maintainers wanted to add more um, context about their releases, they can. Um, so I, I had a lot of fun doing this. Uh, I like I like the idea of encouraging our users to uh, learn their you know learn Git better and uh, you know improve their you know, projects. Um, so so we use Grit. Grit is the uh, Ruby library we use to access Git. Um, it is written by uh, Tom Preston Warner, and uh, it's basically it started out as um, shelling out. It, it started out as a wrapper around the shell. To access the uh, Git data, um, and since then uh, they've uh, you know they've added a lot of uh, performance improvements. You know, where using Ruby to actually read and parse the uh, Git format. So this is like a, this is a quick example of you know getting commits, and that that uh, commits method just runs uh, Git log and gets you back a bunch of you know uh, commits, and then Grit will like parse the uh, output into uh, you know, into objects, you know, commit objects and tree objects and blobs and all that. Um, this is a project that uh, Paul Dowman just uh, showed me, like uh, about a week ago. Um, it's it's an active uh, Git model. It's an active model compliant um, adapter for uh, for Git, and it uses Grit internally. So you can see here we're creating a model it looks just like an active record model, except uh, you know, you're defining you know, various properties and blobs. And then you can access it like an active record model. And it, it basically just stores JSON files like in, you know, in the uh, Git database. And you can you know, reference other blobs and images and things like that. Uh, Ribbit is a project that uh, um, it's it's a Ruby binding to libgit2. Libgit2 is a C implementation of Git. It's uh, it, it was a Ruby or a Google Summer of Code project that uh, that uh, Scott Chacon mentored. It was uh, written by uh, Vicent Marty. And uh, then Scott works on Ribbit, which is just the uh, Ruby bindings for it. Um, one of the things that we can't use Grit for, or we can't use Ruby. In Grit, for we still have to shell out is for uh, is for uh, walking, you know, the the Git graph. You know, like if we uh, if we ask to uh, you know get a commit, you know, we have to get the commit and then walk down to the tree and then to all the blobs. And doing this in Ruby is extremely slow. So we still use, you know, Grit still uses the the shell to shell out to a uh, Git log and ls tree and some other commands like that. Um, Ribbit does it all in C, so it's still really fast. So this is what the uh, Walker interface looks like. We 
you just add like which two commits you want, and then you can just traverse through the, you know, you can just traverse through the uh, commits. You know, the commit will point to its parent commit, and then you go, you know, you just keep going up. Um, wheat is a uh, it's an interesting uh, Git blogging uh, tool. It's uh, it's written in uh, Node.js, and it's uh, it's similar to Jekyll, but the really cool thing about it is it's a live server, so there's no you don't have to build up a bunch of files. You just basically commit you know, your uh, Git database and push it to a server, and then all the caches just just uh, get updated because all the uh, all the caching is done through the SHA. So as soon as you update the reference to the new SHA, all the old caches stay in place and everything, all the new stuff is uh, displayed. Um, so one of the cool things, it, one of the ways it uses Git, um, it uses Git to uh, track revisions of your articles. So it's basically like running the git log command on a specific, on a specific file, and you get back, you know, the, uh, you get back the uh, revision data and uh, they al also lets you embed uh, source code files and images and other things like that with your article. And basically, each article gets its own directory, and then you know, then it has files in there that you can embed in your uh, blog post. So this is what it looks like on the site. You can see on the uh, sidebar, you can see uh, the, the list linking of uh, the code samples, and then uh, you can see the revisions. And another interesting thing about Wheat is it uses Git socially. You know, you bring up community sites, and he's he's very open about it. He's like, hey, if you want to contribute to uh, howtonode.org, just fork my repo, add your content, and we'll edit it. And once it's good enough, you know, we'll add it to the main repo, and and that's that. You know, I, I thought that's uh, that's a really cool way to uh, foster a community. Uh, Gollum is the back end to the uh, new um, GitHub wikis that uh, Tom and I wrote based on, uh, based on a spec that Tom wrote. Um, so basically, with, uh, with Gollum, we're taking advantage of all the, uh, you know, of all the uh, strong points of Git, where you have, uh, well, one thing, um, Git scales down really well. It's not like a complicated thing to install. It's like you just install that command, and you have it, and you don't have to run a server or anything like that, and you have all the data right there, and it's really portable. So, you know, you can just have your, you know, your wiki data locally, and you run, you know, Gollum, and it spins up a web server around it, and you can edit it locally, and then push it up to GitHub or any other host that might support it. Um, so, you can see here we have the full editing interface locally, and it's the same thing that's on github.com. Another thing, you know, obviously Git is good at tracking versions of, of files, which is really important for wikis too. Wikis were, wikis are just uh, very open, and anyone can modify. So it's very important to, uh, you know, keep a keep a log of who does what, and you know that's what Git excels at. So it makes a lot of sense. So you can see here, I'm just calling the uh, the log method to uh, list out the versions of a file, and you know we just render it on the site like that. You know, it's, uh, and then Git is also really good at diffing. This is one of the uh, feature requests on the uh, old GitHub wikis, which just you know, which were just written on the database. So rather than write our own like diffing system, we just take advantage of Git. It spits it out in the format that we like, and you know, we already had code on GitHub for displaying diffs, so it was really easy to uh, throw that in there. So we get. You, know, you get nice diffs like that, so you can see exactly what changed between versions. Um, and then we can also take advantage of other Git features like grep. You can use grep to uh, set up like a really basic um, search interface. You don't have to set up, you know, solar or maintain indexes. This literally, I, I think, it just you know cats all the the contents of the files and runs them through grep. Which you know obviously you won't scale, but most wikis are pretty small, so this this works pretty well. Um, you know, with Git you also have Git hooks, which open up other possibilities. You know, updating caches and publishing other formats, um, and basically integrating with other backend systems. 
you know, like for instance, every time you push a wiki to GitHub, you know, we kick off some jobs that update caches and and uh, things like that, and, you know, indexing the, the data. But um, but Gollum, uh, you know, Gollum presents some challenges, you know, running that on GitHub with all the wikis on there. There's, there's some, you know, Git limitations because it's really designed for hacking on code and maintaining big projects. It's not designed for, you know, uh, you know, gigantic wikis and things like that. Um, so one of the things um, I wanted to generate. I wanted to generate a wiki, uh, feed, an atom feed of all the uh, updated wiki pages. So, so I uh, asked Scott, like, how do I do this? Because I, I have no idea. Like, rather than getting like the log of, you know, uh, through Git and parsing and looking for, you know, pulling out the updated files. So there's the uh, git diff tree command, and if you pass name only, you'll get back just like a list of files. And that, like, I can use that to uh, update our uh, atom feed of latest changes. So I know that these files were updated most recently. But the problem with this, if you look at this query, I'm going back 10, uh, 10 commits from master. The problem with that, though, is if I try and go back more commits than are in the repo, I get back this ugly error. So right away I know if, if, I, need to, if I want to do this reliably on the site, I have to account for the fact that some people don't have 30 updates yet. So I'd have to keep some kind of internal counter of how many commits there are. Um, also, there, there are a few uh, like obscure leaky abstractions in, uh, in grit. Um, git Ruby is the component inside grit that implements parts of git in Ruby. Uh, it's a really confusing name. Um, so on the, on the top, I'm wanting to call uh, ls tree with uh, dash L for long and dash R for recursive. So what, what I want this to do is list out every single file in the repo, including inside subdirectories and things like that. And then also the, the long format means I want the size. But when I call it, I don't get the size. And I, was, I thought there was like some weird bug in my code and I went digging through it and the Git Ruby interface just doesn't implement it. Because again, we have to walk objects. You know, you, th you think about you know calling an LS tree on master. You have to get the commit and just keep walking down all the trees and all the yeah you know, all the all the trees. And for a big repo, this can take some time. But if you're asking for size also, then you have to open up every single file and pull out the size. And you can imagine that that you know that can be a lot of work. But if I if I use the uh, the native method to call right out to grit uh, to git on the command line. It'll do that in C, and it's you know it's super fast. Uh, so this is what we use on the wiki. Uh, also, um, again, Gollum is suited for maybe small to medium-sized wikis. So this is the Radiant wiki, which actually brought up some scaling issues early on when we were uh, in beta. Um, you can see it has only 116 pages, which which is a lot for the GitHub wikis, but it's not very much in the grand scheme of things. So I had to rewrite some of the code for this and make it a little bit faster. And it's, as soon as I pushed that code, I got this ticket on the uh, Gollum project that someone had a wiki with uh, 30,000 pages. And the stuff that I pushed was just insanely slow. So we still have a little bit of work to do there. Um, so yeah, Gollum wikis will probably not scale to something like Wikipedia. You know, they, they have Tons of servers, and I, I don't even know what's going on there, but it's uh, yeah, way out of scope for Gollum, at least right now. Um, so one of, the, one of the issues, one of the uh, um, limitations with uh, Git is it's really designed for just single coders on a, on a machine. They, they, they work locally, and then they push up to, uh, to a, you know, a other repos at a higher level. Um, but this doesn't happen concurrently. If you try and um, if you try and edit or commit to a repo concurrently, you start seeing issues like this, where there's lock files. Um, this, this error message actually came from a Dropbox support thread. Someone, was, someone threw their uh, you know, Git repo on Dropbox, and they're trying to uh, share it with their friends, um, you know, with their coworkers or whatever. And they're just running into all these weird issues where they would commit, and then 
you know, Dropbox would see the lock file and it'd try and, and it would try and sync it with everyone else, but then it, the lock file is removed too quickly for Dropbox, so it, it stays on everyone's machine and then they can't commit anymore. Um, also, if you look at the, uh, the way you make commits, you have to pass the uh, parent SHA, which, you know, the parent SHA is the commit before it that you are updating. You can imagine if you have lots of people updating, say, a wiki or anything centrally located, you know, there, you know, there are possible race conditions there. You know, maybe I edit, you know, one SHA, and then you come in and edit the same SHA. We'll get basically um, two commits that are they're branched, and, um, you know, one of them will get lost because the, uh, it, you know, it has to move up the uh, reference for the master branch, and, you know, basically the last write will win. So, uh, you know, when you look at this, at the commit shots, it's very similar to how uh, vector clocks work in uh, vari various, uh, you know, uh, distributed uh, data stores built on, you know, like the Dynamo system. They use vector clocks. So if two people update to, uh, you know, two different nodes at the same time, you know, you can detect the conflict and figure out some way to resolve it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty complicated, though, to, to work with. Um, you know, this happens all the time in, in Git. You know, we have uh, merge conflicts. You know, so you, know, you, you, you do everything locally, so you never have commit, um, conflicts with yourself. But then when you try and push to, uh, you know, to the main repo, you know, someone else will beat you to it. And then you have to pull their changes in and work out any conflicts. But the thing is, Git doesn't help you out with that. It, only detects the conflicts. Um, really, it requires you to work with the other coder and uh, you know figure out you know the best way to merge the code in and resolve the conflict yourself. Um, so if you want to, if you need to use Git at like a high scale, you have to come up with you know some interesting way to uh, work this out. Like right now, the the wiki doesn't do any doesn't try and do any of this. It uh, really just hopes you don't. Uh, commit at the same time as someone. Um, so the solution, if you want to run, you know, get, if you want to access Git on scale is find Git a wingman. Basically some other, uh, you know, some other tool that can work alongside it. Um, a common one is uh, caching. You know, we use uh, memcache a lot for, uh, you know, for uh, making Git fast. Um, and this is an article that Tom wrote a while ago after they uh, after their big host uh, switch about how they made GitHub fast, and it's about how instead of accessing repos on the local file system, they uh, we built uh, Smoke to uh, you know route requests to uh, you know to multiple file servers. So basically, you know we have like a mapping of repositories to file servers, and we have a proxy that proxies the connection over there, and Right there, Git becomes just like any other database. You know, we start running into similar issues that have with, uh, you know, um, MySQL and queries. You start worrying about how many times you're calling Git and things like that. So one of the issues that we're running into is that the code was originally written with the file, you know, with the uh, repos on the same file system. So things were reasonably flat, uh, fast. But once, you know, once you move over to Smoke, there are some times where some pages will call you know, like five to ten times per page. So that's basically like, you know, uh, basically like uh, unoptimized, uh, you know, Rails apps where, you know, a certain page will fire off like ten queries. You know, you, you want to try and work that down into as few queries as you can. Um, so one of the things that, that's helping with that is we're, you know, just building like simple like wrappers around grit. So um, something like this. This is similar, I guess, to the uh, data mapper pattern. If you're uh, if you're into patterns, but you just have uh, simple methods that that uh, you know they call out to grit, and then you can add caching and things like that around it to make it fast. Uh, and then you can you re replace certain backend stuff. You know, replace Git with other things on you know on the server if you need to. Um, so this is an example of how we would, how uh, you might use uh, memcache or Redis for uh, for caching. You know, you just wrap the uh, you know you just put the actual raw uh, Git command inside inside this uh, cache block, and you know the the results 
go to memcache, and then future hits are served from memory, which helps out a lot. Um, this, this is an example of how I'm using Redis for the, uh, the last updated wiki feed uh, that I talked about earlier. One of the things, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to keep like an internal counter of how many commits a wiki had. So, so we set up a post, uh, post receive hook every time you commit to it that updates this, uh, this Redis uh, sorted set, you know, with the, uh, you know, it's sorted by the committed date and then uh, it's keyed on the name of the page. So then I can use uh, Redis, I can say, okay, what are the, the last three updated pages for this wiki? And it'll just list them out. Um, I can also figure out the uh, date, the last date that a certain page was up updated by getting the z-score. And you know that's just the uh, time and in integers. Um, other possible wingmen that I've looked at or played around with a little bit. Uh, one is Reoc, which is uh, it's a you know d um, distributed key value store similar to you know similar to uh, Cassandra or uh, some other ones. It's based on the uh, Dynamo uh, white paper from Amazon. Um, it has some other interesting features that other key values don't have, like uh, like a has like a simple link database where keys can link to other to uh, to other uh, you know other keys, which I thought worked really well with uh, Git, so, I, so I'm playing around with that a little bit. Um, CouchDB is another NoSQL data store that's very similar to Git. It um, has similar replication properties, and it automatically versions all your content. Um, um, and then uh, VertexDB or other graph data, uh, databases would be a good fit because uh, you know they, they're dealing with uh, relationships of you know, nodes, and there's a lot of that in Git, you know, where you have commits and trees, and how are they related. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges with uh, Git is that the, uh, the relationships are all one way. So, so uh, blobs have no idea what trees point to them. Um, commits only know the parent commit. They don't know commits ahead of them, um, you know, things like that. And, you know, s storing that in a graph database, you know, if, if I wanted to build to a uh, you know, uh, get some more meaningful information out of these uh, relationships would be uh, would be um, helpful. Um, I've seen some articles where they're throwing uh, like Twitter or uh, Facebook uh, social graphs into graphing databases, and you can get in interesting things like uh, you know, like what things your friends are following and things like that. So there's some possibilities there with uh, Git that you know that I'd like to uh, investigate. All right, um, so for, for this talk, I wrote this uh, basically a, a Twitter implementation on Git. So I'm solving all of Twitter's scaling issues with Git. <laughs> Not really, um, anyways. Uh, so it's, it's, on, uh, it's on my GitHub if you wanna get it. But it basically, it, each tweet that you make is stored as a commit in Git. Um, the commit has no content. It doesn't really point to a tree, but you know, it uses the uh, the commit message as your as your tweet. Um, so, you know, this is what the uh, the, uh, the object model looks like. You just create like a time uh, a repo timeline. Basically, each each Git um, repo can store multiple timelines, and and when you add a tweet, it uh, creates a commit inside a branch named after that user. So this is me like opening up my timeline and tweeting. Um, you can also do retweets in uh, in Madrix. Basically, a retweet is a commit with the, uh, the the same message as the tweet, but then I set the author to the original author. So I'm, you know, in that in that retweet, I'm still the uh, committer, but then the original authorship and the you know the the time that they authored it is still maintained. Um, favorites, you can do favorites. They're similar to retweets. Um, I, right now I'm putting them in a separate branch. So this is going, so if I'm favoriting uh, one of uh, Scott's tweets, uh, it goes in the uh, techno weenie dash favorites branch. So all the, you know, all the timelines, you know, stay in their own branches. And then if, if I want to, uh, 
you know, if I want to uh, show them, I just you know run git log on it, and I can get back all the uh, commit messages, and then I can display them. Um, this is what it looks like in uh, doing it from Git. Um, you can see here, uh, yeah, you can see the commits in order. You know, well, reverse chronological order like Twitter. Um, the interesting thing about this is now I can merge timelines together. So if I'm following uh, Atmos, I, you know, I, I, I would pull his repo down and create you know, a local branch based on his branch, and then I just merge them together and then my timeline feed uh, will put them in the right order because the uh, commits, even though they're you know made the you know they have like different parents and things like that, they're still ordered by the uh, the, the uh, commit date. So uh, yeah, and this is what the uh, the log looks like. Um, if you notice, like in in the uh, in Madrix, I I automatically skip any commits with more than one parent or with not uh, with, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I only show commits with one parent. So the first commit has no parents because it's first, and then merge commits will have multiple parents. So I, I just basically skip all those and only display the, uh, you know, the tweets in the branch that I'm looking at. So this is what that looks like from Git. So you see the merge, uh, the merge commit at the top, but then the tweets are still ordered you know, by commit date. Um, these are some articles that, uh, and some books that I used a lot um, in making this presentation. Um, they're really good if, you, if you're interested in like, getting more into the nitty gritty of how uh, Git works. And uh, yeah. um, some other links to the projects I talked about. Um, so there's a link to uh, the slides on GitHub and uh, on Heroku. Um, I'll, I'll be pushing these uh, you know, later this morning. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, totally. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that Git is better than other things. Really, it's just, you know, the thing that I like, I don't like the whole NoSQL banner, but I like that all the NoSQL stores like do things their own way, and they're all very different, and I like evaluating them. Um, Git is definitely a challenge because it's not designed for this, and we run into that like every day. Um, I think there are certain projects like the wiki that, that really makes sense for Git. So that's that's why those work. Basically, anything with like publishing and versions and things like that. But um, people ask for uh, an issue tracker on on Git, which you know would be awesome because you know you can import and export really easily. But yeah, you can't do things like querying, you know, things like that. So. Yeah. Um, th so the question is, have we have we uh, looked at using the API to replace the backend from Git with other or with from Git with other things? Um, I think Scott was working on something that replaced the backend with Cassandra, but I don't know how that went. Um, I mean, we're not using it, so I guess it didn't go that well. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks.